Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is John Hamry. I'd like to welcome you uh, here. I, I am delighted to have you, and I'm delighted to welcome my very good friend, Espen Bardaida. He gives me personal hope, because this is a number two that made it to number one. <laughs> you know, I, something I've never accomplished, and, uh, but I, I draw a great deal of personal joy in his, uh, in his success. I, I've been back to Norway a number of times uh, in, in recent years, and I'd always go to the state secretary's office saying, when, oh Lord, when do we see? <laughs> he finally is recognized for his talent, and of course that, uh, that uh, came through, and he's been appointed defense minister, and we're very glad for that. He's a genuine talent. He also gives hope in a second dimension, which is uh, Espen started life and uh, still, I think, considers one of his great joys being in a think tank. Well, that was real hope for me then. I mean, <laughs> so I think that now that, uh, that there is possible life after think tanks. I'm not sure. I mean, uh, Espen's got a lot, a lot of runway left for him. I don't think I have much left for me. But it, but it is a great joy to welcome him here. I've had opportunities to, to work with, with Espen now for a number, number of years, and uh, we first met when I was in government. And I've always been uh, impressed that he is a, he's a demanding intellect in the right way. I mean, that, uh, your best friend is not someone who tells you what you want to hear. Your best friend is someone who tells you what you need to hear. And uh, Espen has always had that capacity, excuse me, I, Minister Bart Ida has, <laughs> has always had that capacity as a, uh, as a committed friend to tell us what we needed to know. Not always been comfortable. Uh, there have been some, some good, challenging, and pointed exchanges through the years. But invariably, it strengthened us. It strengthened us. It strengthened our confidence in working with Norway. Now, of course, I'm a soft touch, being Norwegian by background, you know, but, uh, but I think it's standing to his reputation. He was warmly greeted when he came to town yesterday, had uh, excellent meetings with uh, Secretary Panetta, and, and uh, there's a wonderful new bright future. But it's going to be a partnership, a genuine partnership going forward. Interesting intellect at, a, at an operational job at the crucial time. So would you please join me in welcoming Minister Bartaida. Thank you. Thank you so much, John, for those uh, very warm words. I was almost getting concerned because you're raising the bar with this uh, beautiful introduction. Uh, but it's great to be here. And as, uh, as John said, I am uh, I'm a transatlanticist at heart, coming from a transatlantically oriented country. And personally, I'm from the think tank world. It's just that uh, for close to 10 years now, I was re realized that maybe my job title is a politician. Uh, but I'm sure that I will be back with the think tanks and continue to come to CSIS as I've always done also in that world. But, uh, but for the moment, uh, Minister of Defense, I served uh, for several years as Deputy Foreign Minister, then Deputy Defense Minister, then Deputy Foreign Minister again, and now uh, was appointed Minister a couple of months ago. And um, I, I want to, my introduction today will be in the future business. And just as a disclaimer to say, I'm not going to speak much about Afghanistan or Libya or Iran, although we are also very concerned about Iran uh, and, and follow what's going there and the collective policy on that closely. We are deeply committed to Afghanistan and Norway will have troops in Afghanistan until the very last day that there is a NATO presence in Afghanistan and we're there in strength and will stay there in strength. And we were an active participant in the operations in Libya, uh, by the way, uh, together with some other smaller northwestern European countries whose air forces should to be very able for that particular campaign, thanks to military transformation plus will and resources. But that's not really what I'm going to talk about now, and I'll ask questions about anything, but my focus is about the future. And I met Secretary Panetta yesterday, and I think we had an extremely good meeting as ministers and, uh, and secretary and as, uh, as a meeting of minds. And I actually said that I have read the defense strategic guidance and I liked it. 
Uh, and I did not say that to be polite, because as John has told, I do not always say things to be polite, but because I actually like it. I'm not, taking a, I'm not addressing the issue of the cuts. I will leave that to the American audience. But the strategic direction that it points out. And, uh, and the reason I say that, it's actually the way we have been thinking for a while, that the world is changing in fundamental ways, not incremental ways. It's getting com fundamentally different from what it used to be. And, and used to be, not as in the Cold War, but used to be as in the short period of unipolarity that followed the Cold War, where we, in a sense, had the challenge of dealing more with asymmetric than with symmetric challenges, but also the opportunity to focus on that rather than, than the potential emergence of uh, symmetric enemies or adversaries. Uh, which in a sense is a challenge and a luxury. And we're leaving that period and we have to look into a future which is fundamentally different. At the, at the heyday of Western dominance, uh, the collective GDP of the West, liberally defined, which would be Europeans, North Americans and, and Australia and so on, was way beyond, way above 60%. Today we're approaching, we're going down to 40%. And by the middle of this decade, it's estimated 30%. So the West is not going to run the world, at least not on its own. There are a lot of people now, it's very fashionable to say that we're entering a multipolar world. I may have used that word myself. But I think that while it's fair to say that unipolarity is over, I'm not sure if multipolarity has arrived. Because multipolarity suggests that somebody else is re ready to, pick, to fill the vacuum. Uh, that somebody is, is, is sort of to take the place that we abandon in sort of the carriers of the system. And I'm not really seeing that. You see emerging powers which have a strong economic dominance on the global scene. It's not only China, it's also the, the Indias, the Brazils, the Indonesias and so on. But I don't yet see that they really go in and take kind of a, a systems carrying role and the way that America first and foremost and America plus its Western friends used to do. That's a very different world and it, that world will, will lead to very different thinking on our military investments and capacity and long-term planning. We've been saying that for quite a while. And our current defense uh, plan, we, we have four-year plans, which are then, you know, in the four-year plans, we're thinking 10 to 20 years ahead, and then we ro roll that over for the next four-year plan and so on. And in the current plan, we were just completing, which ends in 2012, and which I was very instrumental in, in, in writing in a, one of my previous positions as deputy uh, defense ministers, we said many of these things. The central gravity is going to be Asia. The South China Sea is probably going to substitute the Checkpoint Charlie as sort of the center of international security. Um, and, and we have to think about that. And we as a small country have to think about that for two, you know, for two types of reasons. One is that it affects us directly. In our case, because, well, if you're here, and think about China, you'll think about the Pacific, because you have to cross the Pacific to get there. If you're in Norway, it's across the Arctic. And across the Arctic used to be, you know, not the way we thought, because the Arctic was the end of the map, uh, you know, and uh, so there wasn't anything up there. The point is then when you go over, there's something there, and that's Asia, right? And with the, and with the, um, and with the, uh, with the, you know, fundamental changing of the Arctic, not landscape, the seascape, the, the, the melting of the ice, um, this is actually becoming relevant. There's more activity, there are resources being found. We just found a new oil field with, you know, decades of more oil. Good for us, but the Russians will find much more. And there's a lot of interest in the, in the, in the, in the, in the subsea resources, marine resources, fishing, and access, you know, the, the sailing routes and so on. So that's sort of a more immediate reason that we have to follow what's happening in the Asian theater. It's getting closer to us. But, but the second and probably more important reason is that we are part of an alliance in which the biggest member and the most important ally is the U.S. And we have to understand what the U.S. will think about in the future. And as I said to John earlier, regardless of what the U.S. thinks today. So we have to help ourselves to think what, what is probably going to be the outlook of America in the future. We have to make our, not because we're any better at it than Americans themselves, but it's also, it matters to us too. So we also have to deal with that. So what I'm reading in this new uh, Pentagon document is, uh, are things that we've been saying for quite a while, and hence I welcome it. And then I was told that I was actually the first European to say I liked it. <laughs> um, I, I, and I understand, and I don't want to make a comment on what my colleagues have been saying, actually beyond saying that apparently there was a perception 
in this town that there were certain responses that were more of a parochial nature. Why do you leave my base? I mean, my base is, your base is my hotel. town. Why, the, why are you taking it away? I think it's perfectly logical. I think I would do exactly the same thing. And I actually do not see it as a weakening of the transatlantic ties. As long as it is substituted by more dynamic presence, uh, presence that, uh, in exercises, pre-positioning if necessary, as we've been doing, uh, you know, continued and increased intelligence sharing, uh, sharing of awareness, and, and, and continued effort to keep Article 5 relevant. And that's actually quite important, the message, because we, all, we always begin with Article 5, or at least end with Article 5 when we have NATO speeches. But Article 5 is not in such a good shape. It's in not in such a good shape as people think. Not talking about political will, but our actual ability to deliver if something happens in the transatlantic theater of a more classical type of aggression, I am not sure how well we are fit. And I think we're getting worse at it because the many cuts which were happening in a lot of European countries, not mine, because we have real increases in our defense budget, but in many European countries, plus the changes that will happen here, may, if we are not smart, may lead to a further weakening of the core ability to defend ourselves uh, in both the classical and in the more novel ways. And if that happens, if, if NATO is undermined at the core, if NATO is not able to deliver in area in Article 5, uh, we will soon, the, the, the implication will be that NATO will equally be less able to do out of area non Article 5. Because just think of it, non Article 5 presupposes in its own name, you know, that Article 5 exists. And an out of area presupposes area. And that's sort of a theme that we've been raising uh, in the NATO strategic concept process, and I think successfully so, because a number of countries, particularly, interest, this is interesting, particularly the new members of NATO, Norway and the US, had a very good dialogue on this, where some of our West European friends were so so much, so deep into, you know, the current thinking of, of Afghanistan, Iraq type of mission that there wasn't really room for thinking beyond that. And NATO was, began in, identified as being simply the organizations that take our boy, sons and daughters and send them to, to faraway places to do nation building in the desert. And that is, uh, uh, and that's a challenge that we have to take seriously. Uh, we've been working that for a while. I welcome that there is thinking on this uh, in the U.S. and I think it's actually in a very interesting direction. And I again say um, this is not a comment about the cuts; it's a, it's a comment about the direction and the strategic vision that lies, lies behind it. Um, I also want to say a few words about what we've been doing over the last years. We've, as I said, we've kept up and actually increased uh, somewhat our uh, real defense spending. We'll, con we'll continue to do that. But at the same time, we made a lot of rationalization of the armed forces. We used the luxury of not having to cut to actually get rid of a lot of bases and old infrastructure, which was only relevant in a scenario where our defense forces were based on mobilization. Of course, if you're going to mobilize a lot of people, you need the place to place, put them. You need uh, officers who are ready to command people who are normally not in, but only in, in mobilization. You need sort of weapon uh, depots for a lot of people and so on. So we, we did away with most of that in order to invest in very modern platforms with a particular focus on the sea, air, and intel area. So we invested in a new fleet of uh, Aegis uh, frigates, uh, working closely with uh, the US Navy, by the way. We have a lot of programs on situational awareness in our vicinity, closely working bilaterally with the US on top of the NATO partnership. And we've done quite some modernization in our Air Force, and we're purchasing the F-35. Hopefully, we'll get it. So that's also one of the themes uh, of my uh, discussions here. I'm going to see Bob Stevens at Lockheed Martin, and I talk with Panetta about that afterwards. But we, when we chose the F-35, and this is why I, the connection, why, let me make that connection between our strategic outlook into the future and that purchase. We made uh, a, a very complex set of simulations of different scenarios. And we had four candidates. We had the Rafale, the Eurofighter, the next generation Gripen, and the F-35. And the simulation suggested that if we will go on to fight Afghanistan-type wars, we could buy either of these aircraft. They will all do superbly well and more than enough for any one of these missions. Because the adversary is not advanced on the battlefield. They won't have air defense capabilities and air force of their own that actually challenges in a serious way any modern generation aircraft. If, however, we would theoretically be up at any given power, 
in our vicinity, without mentioning any names, uh, uh, who is still innovating and becoming more modern, uh, we would, there was only one aircraft that would do. So, you know, so there was a direct link because on the need to go to continue to invest in the high-end part, also for a small country, and that is only meaningful if you believe that that kind of conflict is theoretically possible. That does, of course, not mean that we think it will happen, and don't get me wrong, but that is theoretically possible that we still live in a world when these things can happen. So that comes back to the theme that rather than assuming that any future conflict will be organized states versus chaos, we can again see a world where you can have a conflict between organized states meeting an organized state. Uh, and that we still deterrence and deterring by presence and deterring by having the right capabilities again becomes meaningful. Um, so that's sort of my, my first point. My second part of this in intervention is share, I'd like to share with you my concern about Europe. I'm very concerned about Europe. And I think you should be more concerned about Europe than most Americans are, because Europe is actually in a rather bad shape. I think for many years, and for quite understandable reasons, the, the main, I mean, the security community in Washington has, the vision of Europe is that there's a, there's a bunch of reasonably rich countries, uh, relatively lazy, and not standing up in America, American-initiated in missions abroad as much as they should. And I understand that perspective. I'm not, it's not critique. But today, there's a completely different type of crisis. So there's, a, there's a crisis at, in the idea of Europe, in Europe. Uh, we have several countries which have now a, a very significant unemployment, particularly among the youth. Uh, Spain has a 45% youth unemployment, which is sustained over time. There is no particular, there is no reason to believe that that's going to change in the next several years. Um, we have a couple of well-established European democracies who have substituted elected politicians with technocratic governments, actually quite good technocratic governments. So I'm not necessarily concerned of those particular countries, but the, 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 the tendency may be alarming, that people don't really believe in sort of elected office in the way they used to do. We have some countries in Eastern Europe who are saying sort of moving away from democracy rather than towards democracy. And the crisis for many Europeans resembles in certain aspects the 1930s, in certain aspects. The depth of the economic crisis, the, 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 the economic crisis turning into a social crisis because of unemployment, people losing their houses and so on. Some of this, of course, is well known in America as well, but it's deeper in certain European countries. And, um, uh, and, and then the potential that the, the economic and social problem can be a political problem, domestic, because we people lose faith in the leaders, and in the next round, a security policy problem that can be exported from one country to the other. There is ample room these days for xenophobic responses for trying to export the problem from one country to the other. That's the aspect where the crisis resembles the 1930s, where we have a major difference from the 1930s is Two things, we have several gener more generations with an experience of democracy, which gives a certain robustness. And secondly, that we have a, a, a whole series of institutions, European and global, that can be used for collective action. European Union itself, obviously, um, NATO on the security front, the, the World Bank, the, the IMF, uh, the European Bank. Uh, the, the, these institutions are there now, they weren't there in the 30s. But they, are not, they will not fix the problem in and by themselves. It requires political will and leadership, and that will and leadership is not really there. And that's, uh, that's a serious problem. That problem, as I'm describing it, is an internal problem to Europe, but it's also a problem for the rest of the world. And it's particularly a problem to the vicinity of Europe, because um, one of the great successes, and this is our collective success of the 1990s, was the way we peacefully helped dismantling the um, the Warsaw Pact, uh, the Comic-Con, and where we reached out to hand saying to a lot of countries that used to be in principle our adversaries because they were allied with the Soviet Union, that you are welcome not only to become our friends, but to become part of us, part of the collective us, the European integration project and the transatlantic security project. That had a tremendous security effect. It didn't say bang, so it wasn't reported maybe as security, but it's probably the best investment ever at least in my part of the world, in, in enhancing our own collective security. But that, attraction, that was based on the power of attraction. It, it was based on the, on, the, on the sense that Europe was able to portray that this was a center of growth and progress and modernity that a lot of countries and a lot of societies, I mean, talk about people, a lot of people wanted to join. 
because it looked nice. In a sense, not completely uh, a, a different to what the, the way a lot of Europeans saw to America after the Cold War. You know, really, it, it wasn't only the, the, the you know the the money and the defense protection, but it was also actually it was very attractive. It looked you know it was uh, it was modern, and it was freedom, and it was cars, and it was Hollywood, and it was you know Marilyn Monroe, and there were all the you know all these things that sort of made America attractive to Europeans. Some of that was for, in the 90s, the European attraction to East European countries and so on. Now, that's not really there any longer. So the disciplining effect of the promise of future membership is much weaker than it used to be. And that's, signif and that's something you have to think about because that's actually, that, that's the security scale issue. In my most recent job before my current job in, in, in foreign affairs, I was dealing with the global portfolio, and one of the things we invested a lot in was to engage in strategic dialogue with emerging powers. So you, how, how can we find sort of connections with, with the emerging powers, particularly the many emerging powers that are democratic in nature, India obviously, but also look at Brazil and Indonesia. Brazil and Indonesia are interesting because their economic takeoff happens to coincide with their democratization process, which is really good news for us, those of us who believe that there is a correlation between, uh, you know, uh, uh, economy and, and, and political system. Um, so these are extremely interesting partners to talk to. And I made the follow up some observation over the last year, and I had the same impression in Jakarta and Brasilia only months ago, that when I went there to say, how are things around here? The answer was, quite good. We're concerned about you. Hmm? Right? So in Brasil, said, well, fantastic growth. You know, Latin America is better than ever. More democracy, more progress many issues to solve, but we're working on it. But we're really concerned about Europe. And maybe they're right. Because they were not, maybe they were a little bit concerned about us because they like us. But the main reason, of course, they're concerned about us because of the spreading effect that this can have. So this is a very different background from what we've been thinking, assuming now for the last uh, 20 years, which was basically in one way or the other since the end of the Cold War, that we were running the world. Uh, we were on top, our model was succeeding. And what we had to do was to go out and fix other people's problems, o often in a desert. <laughs> but, 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 you know, and, 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 and so that world has changed. And it hasn't changed, I mean, and, and we are still going on. I mean, we still have to commit to what we started. That's not my point. But my point is when we do the long-term planning, we have to have this sort of broader vision. Third point, what does it mean for NATO? Well, first, and you would expect me to say that as a, as a born Atlanticist from a strongly Atlantic country, uh, that NATO is more important than ever. You know, that's the policy line at any given moment, but this time it's really true. Because, uh, it, because you know, it's in our collective interest to make this sort of transatlantic pro pro project prosperous again, uh, um, because there are, the alternatives is so bad. And the alternative for the US of a kind of implosion of Europe is not nice. Uh, obviously, a similar, I mean, a potential implosion of America would be extremely unpopular in Europe for the same type of reason. But also because they, with this sort of lower relative weight in, in, in the world, at least we have to stick together in order to promote our values and fr freedom and ideas and, and systems, which are now maybe again about to be contested. Not right now in a very dramatic way, but maybe in sort of the long vision, and that has some implications also for NATO and NATO cohesion. I already mentioned the need to re-establish a firm belief in Article 5 and our collective capabilities, particularly our collective uh, conventional uh, capabilities, which I think has been withering away faster than both our ability to deploy operations to faraway theaters and our nuclear capabilities. Um, and, and it's very important now that on the road to Chicago that we put this at center of the discussion, that we do not just go on as, as usual, but we try to shape the Chicago agenda so that it really addresses this issue. One of the answers is what is called the smart defense. And smart defense, which is a vision we share and which we've actually been working on for many years, so we have some concrete examples of smart defense. Let me just share a couple of them. We have, uh, for many years, uh, I mean, we have the F-16. Our F-16 uh, environment have been working with the Danish, the Dutch, the Belgian, and the Portuguese F-16 uh, countries in something called the EPAF. And we've both saved a lot of money on doing things together, purchasing, upgrading, thinking, planning, training, 
and also got better by doing that. Of course, all of us also working closely with the, with the US Air Force um, on that. That was an early example of smart defense that actually delivered, and we could see a significant difference in Libya between those who had been involved in that and some other countries who also had aircraft, but not the same level of interoperability, to put it in that way. And, um, uh, and we are also in the Nordic group being uh, very, for several years now, trying to purchase uh, important equipment together, uh, gaining the advantage of being a larger purchaser, but also saving money by doing, you know, the support, sharing some of the support costs so that we can have more money for the actual operational and it actually works. And we can come up with a, some examples that it does work. It's not theory, but it does work. Um, and that's sort of the smart defense has both a narrow interpretation, which is sort of investing in certain common platforms, and a broader interpretation, which is doing things in a smart way. Uh, that's what NATO now has to do. And it's, it's been on the agenda for a long time, but it's more important than ever that we do that. But I must be, admit that I am not extremely optimistic that we will achieve it in the short run, and that's based on our own experience and having worked along for many years on military transformation, I learned one lesson, which is that it's a very good idea, but it, it hurts before it pays off. Because the, 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 the first year, when you, when you change something in a military structure, assuming that you have to have a military all the time, you can't sort of say that we'll, we'll be out of business for five years and then come back. So assuming that you want to sort of maintain a certain level throughout, you have to do a lot of things on top of just the running costs uh, while you change in order to see maybe in four, seven, 10, 15 years that the synergy effects comes in. We see them coming, so it's for real, it works but it will not work this year. So a decision in February to go for smart defense will not deliver anything in May. It may deliver in May, but it will May 2017, not in May 2012. So, you know, and, and since my, many of my colleagues in Europe will now be told by their for, by the by finance minister, you know, to cut money, not in 2017, but this year, it's difficult to square the circle. We can all agree that it's smart, but it, it is difficult. So it really takes some serious, uh, serious uh, focus to get there. We also did some exercises based on, the, based on the success in the NATO strategic concept of enhancing the Article 5 dimension of the alliance by actually having some force uh, planning and some defense planning for some of the new members, which weren't really planned for before. We've conducted some exercises uh, with a kind of... Uh, modernized Article 5 scenario, and the lesson is that we're not so good at this. As I mentioned, we're not so good at it. I mean, some of that has withered away because of the intense speed of operation. The, the, the you know, NATO commands that were supposedly both, you know, were supposed both to run an operation and to think about the future were so much sort of drawn into the operation that they forget thinking about the future and the fundamental lessons were lost, and that has, as I said, some long-term implications. I conclude there, and my main point and main message is that uh, the world is very different for all of us. Europe is in the real, is real trouble, I mean, potential security implications, and this is something that an American security audience needs to relate to, I think, more than that what has already happened. And the arguments for maintaining a strong and solid and vital uh, transatlantic alliance are stronger than they ever were. Thank you for the attention, Alan. Minister Barzetta, thank you so much. Uh, rare is an opportunity when a minister gives us a tour, a candid, clear assessment. I think sometimes the transatlantic relationship is plagued by giving each other the talking points we've heard for decades. And sometimes good friends have to really speak very truthfully. And particularly in a public setting where we can have a debate and dialogue. So you gave us a, a very great treat and privilege. Good morning, everyone. I'm Heather Conley. I direct the Europe program. And uh, we also, in addition to focusing on Europe, uh, our Norwegian colleagues have also uh, provided an opportunity for CSIS to take a look at the Arctic, uh, the high north, as our Norwegian friends call it. We keep telling them, we just call it the Arctic here. Um, and uh, to, to provide some, some good uh, think tank work uh, in that area in the long term. So we're very grateful to you. So we have a wonderful opportunity for the next hour or so to have a, a wonderful candid conversation with Minister Barth Ida. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that this is an 
on-the-record presentation. Um, and if you could raise your hands and, and provide your affiliation, uh, we are very anxious to get this dialogue started. But as the moderator, I'm going to take my prerogative and throw out the first pitch, as we like to say here. You're in the batting cage, Espen, uh, uh, for these many balls, curveballs, fastballs, slow balls, whatever you'd like to throw in here to, to the cage. And my first question, looking to the road to Chicago, one element of the agenda will be missile defense, obviously, and the continued uh, conversation, and it's, it's growing increasingly strained conversation with Russia and NATO on future missile defense architecture. So I'd, I'd appreciate your perspective uh, on that. And while we're on Russia, I have to ask an Arctic question. I can't hold myself back. Um, obviously, Norway and Russia uh, have worked incredibly cooperatively in the Arctic. And in fact, uh, when you last visited CSIS and spoke publicly, you were unveiling uh, a new demarcation agreement in the Arctic, uh, a 40-year uh, agreement, or at least in the works, which was really heralded as a, a sign of the, that the Arctic will be a, a place of multilateral cooperation. I'd love your perspective on, uh, on the Arctic security environment today, uh, and particular attention to enhancing Russia Russian cooperation, security cooperation in the Arctic. So those are my first two pitches, and then I promise we'll open it up to you, Espen. Good. Well, um, missile defense, we decided in Lisbon on the uh, phased approach missile defense. Uh, we're con we'll also stick to that. It's very important that we have uh, an open door to solid participation with Russia and good information to the Russians, but they are not supposed to have a veto on where we go. And so they're invited in, and the invi invitation should remain open, but we will go on uh, in any case. And, and the argument, of course, is that the um, way back in the Cold War, there were certain good reasons not to have an a you know, well to have an ABN treaty and not to invest in missile defense because we we were kind of surviving on each other's vulnerability. Now, of course, when when potential ad adversaries are of a completely different nature, uh, like a major country in the in in the uh, Middle East, uh, that that logic is gone. You need a complete you need a defensive posture as a part of the system. So. We'll have to continue to work with that uh, for reasons which has nothing to do with Russia. And then we have to have a dialogue with Russia as good as we can. I agree with you that it's strained right now. And it's a question about what it will look like at Chicago. But, uh, but, but it's, the, it's, a, it's, it's our idea, not theirs. And we're going to continue on that one. On the Arctic, yes, I'll, the, the, the delineation agreement with Russia was a great success. It was definitely, and I can testify to that, a great success for Norwegian diplomacy, but I actually have the strong impression that the Russians also agree that this was a, a success for their diplomacy. This was actually because we applied the United Nations Law of the Seas Convention, which was a very useful tool, and I'll use every opportunity to encourage any country that hasn't yet signed Thank to you. use the opportunity. Please keep um, encouraging us over and, uh, and over. And the U.S. is actually only losing out or not signing because your current position is that you respect everybody else's claim, but you can't make your own claims because you haven't signed the treaty. And I'm still struggling to find out how that is smart. But, uh, um, but, but, it, but, but the negotiation is very interesting. And let me repeat what I said then when I was just, it was actually the day it was unveiled. So it was, a, and, and you were a, always perfectly timed. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, we had negotiated for, 20, for 40 years, four zero years, first, first with the Soviet Union, then with uh, Russia, um, always with the ambition actually to succeed. But the negotiations were, you know, they moved forward with glaciological speed. So it was only with the melting of the ice that it uh, started to work faster. And eventually we were able to divide the area into two. It's much more complex, legally speaking, what happened. It was based on precedent that was being developed in in other cases, there was, you know, there was something in the, the Black Sea and some other areas where there were court decisions that sort of laid the foundation for where we would fall down. But it's clearly to both countries' benefit. Now we can explore and exploit the resources on our respective sides of that before we had to stay away from that. But also because a potential source of, tension, a potential source of conflict is taken away. So it does actually confirm to what is our main message on the Arctic or high north, which is high north, low tension. And that uh, the Arctic is actually just the sea. It is not like the Antarctica, which is land with sea on it. So if the ice melts on Antarctica, first we're in deep trouble because there's much more ice there. But if it happened, it will be land, and that's why we need the treaty. In the 
Arctic is just water, so is there another ocean opening up? It is opening, is this opening up? And we have to deal with that. That's what we've been talking to you and a lot of other people on for many years. Thank you. Yes, sir. The gentleman in the back. And you just wait for a microphone. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Chuck Berry with uh, National Finch University, and thank you very much for your comments, uh, Minister Barthada. Uh, my question is uh, about the, the effect of sovereignty issues on smart defense. You mentioned this is a long stroke engine. Its payoff is years down the road, and that makes sense. But we can also look back and see that there were many efforts in the past to uh, synthesize either purchasing or logistics efforts. Uh, yesterday in the, in the defense news, there was a, an article about uh, uh, cooperation on literal defense in the Baltics, the Baltic Sea, uh, with the Baltic states, and I think I mentioned Finland and, uh, and Sweden, but not Norway. Uh, my question is, uh, as you see this Euro crisis uh, kind of pulling countries apart, uh, is the opportunity maybe lost for, uh, for countries to collaborate in smart defense? Because the, the, the economic crisis would tend to fuse us together, but the euro crisis is pulling them apart. Well, thanks. Good to see you, Chuck. Um, the, well, there are, again, I mean, there, there are different levels of this. Because if you talk about actually investing in common, a common system, like we used to have AVAX, and we have AVAX, but it's an old system, uh, well, then at least you make sure that you get it even if one or several countries do not, is not involved in a particular operation. That actually happened recently and worked. Uh, we have then the uh, program like the, C the C-17 pool that we have joined with a number of other countries. You, you buy ours, you respect that the others use it for whatever purpose. We, we use it for our purposes and other countries can use it for this purpose, but we own it together. And as to put it mildly, it's much cheaper to own it together to have your own fleet of C-17s. I know the price. Um, uh, so, so that's sort of one level. Uh, the other one is the more, the more extended version, which is that this, the, the, the effects of having buying the same equipment, uh, cooperating on the uh, upgrading and the training facilities, that can actually be done even if you, in the operational end, are not integrating and becoming dependent on each other. And of course, in the Nordic experience, that was particularly important because uh, a, a NATO country like Norway, uh, although we are enthusiastic about working closely with the Swedes, we cannot make ourselves dependent on the Swedish decision to join or not the NATO operation. So we must retain, and uh, uh, you know, a, 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 this is not really sovereign, but we must retain an, an, a, you know, a, a prerogative of the NATO system over, over the Nordic. But that is perfectly achievable as long as you think it into the system. Uh, and that's what I think we're trying to do. So some of the experiences I was describing and could you share in much more detail actually suggests that you can square that circle as well. At the very sort of deepest end is the systems that only work with everybody actively is in favor every time you work it. And then, of course, you have certain issues on the sovereignty side. Sir, good morning. Uh, George Nicholson from Stratcorp. Alluding to the success of programs like the joint C-17, the joint AWACS, I know one of the things, the tyranny of distances up in the north uh, of looking at a SAR, search and rescue capability, or even with the success of special operations growing and everything else, is Norway or do you see any uh, uh, efforts of looking at, for instance, a joint CV-22 capability that gives you the range and the speed and the area coverage that could do search and rescue? could support special operations forces or can support humanitarian operations. Well, and if that's I can jump on. Yeah. If you could just also expand a bit on the challenges of search and rescue in the yeah. Arctic. And I know there's some really unique stories coming out of some Norwegian operations about how incredibly difficult it is to perform in the Arctic. Well, I mean, I, I, it's not on the table, but it's not excluded either to have that kind of joint investment. What we have done uh, so far is that the Arctic Council, in its last meet, ministerial meeting, decided to delineate the responsibilities between the countries in the north, between Canada, U.S., Denmark, Norway, Russia, and also to, to um, start an exchange about information systems and who to call and when to call and to how to cooperate on the real-life SAR operation. 
uh, that is sort of way below actually co invest, uh, common platforms, but at least it's the beginning. And I, as I keep saying to people, we, we, we probably have what we need for the current amount of activity, but we definitely do not have what we need for the next 20 years, because there will be much more sailing activity, transport ships, cruise ships uh, up there. Uh, and, and there is uh, some issues on the SAR capacity. And I think an, an even more obvious issue for joint investments is the situational awareness, because the the geostationary satellites only covers up to 79, 80 degrees, north and south. So they don't cover the North Pole and the last 10 degrees. And, uh, and, and we are not really there with a complete sort of real life uh, picture of what's going on up there that is compatible with the expected future activity. And those investments will be so expensive that I think few countries, I mean, maybe the US, but few other countries can do it on their own. And I guess that will be an area for, for joint investments uh, coming out of the Arctic issue. Thank you. Clara O'Donnell, visiting fellow at Brookings. I had uh, two questions on Libya. The first is, of the various strains that became apparent in the armed forces of several European countries during the operations, which did you consider the most problematic? And the second one is, there's been a view which has been expressed by several US officials and European officials that on the trends of the current spending cuts, several European countries would not be able to perform as they did in Libya several years down the line, and this would apply to the UK. To what extent do you agree with that assessment? Thanks. Absolutely. I mean, I think, um, well, f first I should say, I think Libya was a success, that we made it. So, I mean, that's the, the starting point, is not that it was a failure, it was a, it was a success, it was the right thing to do, and we did it, and, and the outcome, as of now, looks far better than the alternative, which was not doing anything with, uh, with Gaddafi. Uh, and it's important to remember, I think that's sometimes forgotten, that this was not a NATO decision. This was a, it was a UN Security Council political decision, and then it was an ad hoc coalition basically forged in Paris, in the Alice Palace. I was there with our prime minister. I saw it happening. Uh, that was, you know, it was, um, let me put it away, the, 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 the preparedness were not suggesting that this would definitely become a success. But it did. And then only later it sort of reverted to NATO for lack of something else. And that's important when we, and we, we were a country who went straight into it. We were really committed to it. We sent uh, F-16s that did a good job and they, they did much of the, you know, a fair share of the, of the heavy bombing, precision bombing was done by Norway, but also countries like Denmark, Belgium, smaller countries who have this capacity. Uh, but I would be careful not to criticize countries who didn't join it because it wasn't, I mean, if NATO decides in the first place, then there's another kind of moral commitment. In this case, it was more that it was accepted by Germany and others that you use the NATO backbone without, you know, actually taking an active part of it. So we have to understand the nuance in that. But to your second part, and, and, and well, I mean, there were some countries experienced a lack of munitions. Not because they didn't have much, but because we agreed only to use the most advanced munitions, which are precision-guided missiles, in order to have a kinetic effect exactly where you wanted it and nowhere else, because this was a protection of civilians campaign, and you know, to start by inflicting mass damage on civilians would not be very helpful to the political purpose of the campaign. That, of course, meant that a lot of countries, not us, by the way, but several countries actually sort of used up most of their stocks and how to repurchase most of that and had to loan from each other. And there were certain technical issues. There were one of the more committed countries was Sweden uh, and they sent the Gripens. They didn't do bombing. They did a lot of important uh, surveillance uh, jobs. Um, for the first two weeks, they didn't get the NATO uh, classified information or actually they did get it, but they didn't get it into the airplane. They had to go with the diskette to another place and take it back, which is kind of awkward in these days. And uh, so there were kind of that kind of, of lessons learned. But all in all, I think we did quite well in Libya. I would be extremely careful to suggest that we're going to do it well next time around, because there were some unique circumstances around Libya. I mean, Gaddafi was more isolated than most leaders have ever been. Sort of the, the collective will, at least at the beginning at Security Council, was surprisingly high. I mean, we focus on the division, actually, it was surprisingly high. And, uh, and you could fly straight into Libya from allied airspace. How often does that happen, right? So, uh, and on top of that, it's a flat desert and people driving tanks in a desert is relatively easy to identify if you have modern technology. This, this is not normally what's happening. And so, I, while celebrating, let's not think that this is the golden key that will all solve all problems on the cheap. Um, 
And to your second part, yes, I think it's interesting to recognize that some of the equipment that actually did well in Libya is now being scrapped by some countries. I, I, uh, but I, again, I'm not going to go into their decisions. But I will say that my view is we have to keep up a high-end capability. Let's, let's be careful when we cut not to cut in the upper ranges. I think it's better to cut in sort of these sort of large army structures if we have to make a choice, because it's more likely that we'll need sort of sea air uh, uh, capacities than sort of sustained army operations in the future, as I see the future, and it happens to be as Pentagon sees the future. Uh, thank you, Lloyd Hand King and Spalling, Mr. Minister. To piggyback on the last question, and not to lure you into uh, political discourse in the U.S., but <laughs> I'm sure you're aware that the president uh, uh, was characterized as having led from behind. Mm. Uh, in the context on Libya, in the context of your early remarks about the increased emphasis on collective security and smart defense, it would be interesting to have the European view of the U.S. role in the Libya operation. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm really glad you asked that question because I, I wonder what's the problem with, I mean, I actually think that there, I think there was some sound thinking in this country, uh, in the White House, I think also at the Pentagon at the time, that maybe not every operation should be led by the Americans. I mean, there are certain echoes of other operations that would emerge if, if there was a very strong American push. So actually to allow a couple of European countries, UK, France, to take the lead and then be joined by us and others, was probably politically quite smart. Now, what we discovered, of course, was that although we, many of us have capable aircraft, much of the sort of intel and systems uh, backbone that you always need is actually only present on American platforms. And uh, so, so, you know, the U.S. had to be there in a certain way. But it was a demonstration that it's possible to have an operation where the U.S. is not always in the lead, and I think that's actually good. I think that's, uh, I mean, it, and, and I think the lessons that we Europeans have to draw from that are lessons that, you know, if we, if we learn them, we'll make a better collective defense system in the future. And so I, I never really understood why a lot of people here thought this was so bad. Maybe this was great. Domestic mm. politics. Yeah, point. Yes, sir, thank you. Oh, no, one second, wait for the microphone. Is that me? Yes, sir, yes, sir. I'm Julian Josephson with uh, Bootstrap Press here in this area. <laughs> Your, your um, remarks on the resources in the Arctic sort of um, take me back to another meeting I attended 10 years ago in which all this was predicted. So let me, um, that there would be exploitation of resources and more um, military, non-military uh, ship traffic in the high north as the years went on. I heard this first um, mentioned in February 2002 at a Marine Technology Society meeting. To um, continue, do you see as more resources become found, av you know, available, uh, do you see that there could be possible in a international tensions over those that currently, you know, are, do not exist or are dormant? And secondly, with the exploitation, the con continued use of the Arctic Ocean, the high north, what would be done to protect the environment up there, which given still the very, very low temperatures, you have uh, much different um, rules of biology and chemistry from what you have in our more equable latitudes. Thank you. Excellent question. and, and um Good for what was the marine technology seminar? Good for them because that's um, they were they were right. <laughs> that, that was Cap, uh, uh, Commander Steve Warren who yeah. predicted that at the yeah. time. Well done, he was right. Well, um, the resources are definitely there. We're we're seeing it seeming happening now. We just found oil. The Russians have much more resource of oil. The good news is that as of now, most of the known uh, or expected re you know oil and gas resources are on within the defined area of one country's economic zone. So there is no particular reason for a conflict. I mean, the, that may change, but, but most, most of this is relatively close to land and hence within the economic zones. And as we get them delineated, particularly when everybody signs the Law of the Seas Convention, um, you know, the <laughs> I'll be only twice, right? <laughs> uh, you know, the, the, that kind of tension is actually being reduced. Uh, you know, the, res the resource war. 
but, but, but the need for collective management is going up. And let's take the fish stocks, because fish do not respect the economic zone. They fish, they swim whatever they like. And unfortunately, we have to discipline them. And, and, and one of the interesting things that's going on is that the, 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 the several species of fish who, for, and this is very, and by the way, this is very important for the world. This is not only for fishing countries, for the world, because we have, you know, we used to have enough food on this planet, we just weren't good at distributing it. Now we actually do not have enough food. So we have to eat more fish, and that's you know, an enormous potential, but only if we have good management. If we, don't, if we exploit all the fish now and, and eat it, there will be no more fish in the future and we'll have a bigger problem. So to have sort of a, a, a fish stock management is extremely important, and that is potentially could lead to tension if we don't get it right. And, and many of the fish stocks in the Arctic are now migrating further north because they prefer cold water and with the general warming they go further north so they go to other areas and they do actually introduce uh, biological problems because they, they meet other species in a very equilibrated um, biosphere uh, which doesn't fit and all these, these are things we look into and also what we see and also what, you know, what we see on the south Pole or on the waters around the South Pole is that the the warming of the poles is actually twice as fast as the warming in the equator. So if we have a two percent, two degrees increase in the world, we'll have a four degrees increase in the in the poles. So I mean, again, this is not first and foremost the security issue, but it has many potential security implications. The third one, of course, is access, because when 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 this will be the preferred sailing route from Asia to Europe, somebody has to look after what's sailing there. And most of that are goods we like to have, but some of that will be goods we would rather not see on our shores, and somebody has to look after that as well. And nobody's right now. Uh, thank you, Mr. Minister. John Glassman from the Northrop Grumman Corporation. Um, you spoke about the potential capability gaps in Europe, particularly in the high-end uh, systems. Uh, yet the fiscal crisis, with the exception of Norway, <laughs> almost makes this a self-fulfilling prophecy. There's no surplus market in the U.S. or in Europe. So thinking about how one could stimulate that kind of investment, uh, one has to think of importing regions like the Persian Gulf or India. Do you think there's any logic behind some kind of an Atlantic approach to those markets? As you know, in the Persian Gulf, the United States is becoming extremely dominant. So uh, is there any possibility, any con concept you can think of for an Atlantic U.S.-European approach to these importing markets? In the... In the Persian Gulf and say, India, yeah. for example. Yes, I think so. Um, <laughs> I'm not exactly certain. But I, but what you mean in the Arctic or in the Persian Gulf, or where, where was the address? Well, I think to new I, markets, what right? I mean is that, Emerging uh, markets. It's unlikely that European industries are going to invest in the uh, okay, systems. Okay, got it. I mean, I, I mean I, the emerging economies will eventually have to take more of the burden of doing many of these things as well. So, you know, to build strong partnerships with uh, other countries outside the typical Western club in order to co-finance uh, things of common interest is going to be very important. I think one, it was not exactly what you mentioned, but the piracy problem in the Indian Ocean is not only a Western problem. It's, all, I mean, it's the Indian Ocean, so at least India is interested, and a lot of other countries are actually getting interested in that. And I think that's actually part of the answer, that rather than believing that this can be NATO or EU only, we will have to build partnerships with countries which share our goal in this particular setting, although they may not share all our other goals, but in this particular setting, can forge some rather new interesting alliances with other maritime powers in particular. Hi, John Gunderson uh, with the Foreign Service Institute and National Defense University. Uh, Mr. Minister, uh, you as a think tank person and somebody with the Foreign Ministry as well as the uh, Ministry of Defense, I'd like to sort of turn your attention to the Middle East. Uh, and we don't know what's going to happen in two years. We don't know what's going to happen in two weeks or two months uh, in Iran and Syria, places like this. Uh, Obviously, it's a foreign policy issue, but it's certainly a security issue. I'd just like you to give some thoughts as to Norwegian and other thinking on Iran, because mm. Norway's had a long bilateral relationship and a lot of issues with the Straits of Hormuz, mm. Syria, what next? 
Is there any thinking at, at the ministry of what to do? What would NATO involvement be? What is the Norwegian thinking on those issues? I mean, unfortunately, I don't have the all, on, all the answers either. And it would be very good. You know, first I'll fix the problem, then we'll get the peace prize. So that would be better. <laughs> but, uh, 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 but, you know but, the committee, right? I know the committee. A <laughs> well, little too well. Little yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, the, uh, well, I mean, I'm sure that part of the answer is that we stick together and have a common posture. And that posture uh, is both forceful and uh, has a door for an alternative outcome. Uh, that's quite easy to say. That's at least part of the answer, but it is not the whole answer. And obviously also to, in, in, in the case of Iran, it's uh, at least to make sure that every other country that is as concerned as we are with Iran, and those are many, there are many countries with whom we don't work that much, but who share so concerned with Iran, that they are on board in that policy rather than we try to go it alone or to encourage anybody else to go it alone in a way which then trigger a completely different set of issues. Uh, you know, a, a, an attack on Iran from a certain country that might be a candidate can trigger a whole set of other issues around the Middle East that we have to take seriously. Uh, but, um, but I don't really have, have, the, have the big answer on that. I think what is, what is very important, and again, sometimes it's important to change our mental maps. And when we look back at the Arab Spring, you know, what was it? Was it absolutely successful? No. Was it absolutely failed? Not, no. You know, there's uh, Tunisia doing quite okay. There were interesting trends in Egypt. We don't really know yet. We, we saw what happened in Libya. Uh, we have seen a new face of the Middle East because the, the, the picture I think many Americans and Europeans had about the typical Arab youth is somebody who is sort of preparing, I mean, the, the, the completely false picture, but the, the assumption is that somebody is planning to blow up something Western. And then what we see are people in in genes, uh, uh, you know, communicating on Twitter and asking for democracy. So it's sort of it's a completely different picture, which was a very nice and heartening uh, impression. And I think we saw about a year ago now a, a, an important mental shift from the assumption that things are. I mean, until then we thought things are bad in the Middle East and they can only get worse. So the only thing we can do is try to keep them as they are, to uh, uh, the assumption that actually things are bad but they can get better. And at times we should allow them to get better and to see some openings. I think the, I, I think it's extremely important to have a very solid dialogue with Turkey, who is a success, successful, you know, democratize, democratizing Muslim country, uh, with sort of some model approaches that could be relevant. I'm all aware about the difference between the Arabs and the Turks and so on, but I mean there's something there that we have to explore further. I think. To, to, when you talk about the big Arab picture. And on Assad, of course, we all think he should go, and um, eventually he will. I don't know when, but it's going to happen someday because it's not sustainable in the long run. But I'm afraid that we're going to see a lot of blood being spilled before we get there. And I don't have a good answer on that either. Thank you. Yes, Arno, and we'll do a two for Arno and Steve. Owner de Borgraf, CSIS, Mr. Minister. I could I take you back to your, what you referred to as shifting perceptions of global power in the years to come? Mm. And I noticed that in Southeast Asia, in the South China Seas now, the expression of Finlandization is already being used. And I think most of us remember what that meant during the Cold War. And I was wondering whether you would agree that these perceptions are shifting in the wrong direction in the South China Seas at the present time. I, I, the, what would be the argument about Finlandization in the South Finlandization, sir, during the Cold War was shifting. No, I know what that is, but yeah. I mean, what, what is the corollary today in the, would be who's shifting. being Finland? Uh, yeah. Some of the powers in Southeast Asia right. okay. see that shifting per perceptions of power are going in the wrong direction, as we see them. Mm. Well, my impression is that the, the, uh, until some years ago, uh, the, the way China was growing was a kind of inclusive, friendly, soft power growth that re neighboring countries thought was quite good because it created sort of a, a powerhouse of economic growth that they could connect to. I think over the last few years that has changed to a somewhat more assertive line which is actually pushing a number of its neighbors in the completely opposite direction. And I think, you know, when, when the U.S. is putting more emphasis on, on the stability in the South China Sea, that is very welcome around the South China Sea, obviously from countries like Korea and Japan. But that, interestingly, also from Vietnam, for instance, and you know, as we all remember, that wasn't always the case. But you know, today that's a very different setting. So, so I'm not really sure if I see the Finland in this. 
Um, and by the way, you know, since you mentioned Finlandization, I have a complete. I I I never liked the concept because I think actually Finland did as as well as they possibly could, given the extremely difficult circumstance they would offer after the Second World War. And then they, it's unfair. And I'm not letting you do that because I've used an example. But I mean, it's unfair to Finland because the alternative to Finlandization was to become a Soviet, the, you know, as a colony. And, uh, and if that's the alternative, the Finnish model was quite successful. But, but, I mean, but, my, but the main point where I think we agree is that this is really becoming the center of the world when it comes to security. And, and, and I'm not saying that because I think we're looking at you know, a direct confrontation. But, but many of the issues of really strategic value, they, have to, they, they move around this issue. Our experience with the Russians in actually settling an issue, well, that will be the third and last time, based on the law of the seas convention, uh, is something that some of our, our uh, colleagues down there in the non-China part of, of that region is very interested in because there are some lessons to be learned from how a small country actually can use that arrangement to settle with a big country. I, as far as I understand, the Chinese position is that they respect the law of the seas convention, but it doesn't apply because the claim was already there, which is legally a strange position. Uh, to put it carefully. And also, since it's called the South China Sea, it sort of suggests that it's Chinese, which is, would also suggest that the Indian Ocean is India's. Uh, and so, um, or that the Norwegian Sea is Norwegian, which of course we... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we're thinking of it, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah sorry. No, so I don't really, I don't really, I'd actually rather see that there's an increasing interest in, in maintaining uh, the presence of the US and maybe some other European countries in, in, in that region. As a small uh, example, and I, I, we, in a previous seminar today, I saw General Sharp, who used to serve, lead your uh, brilliant general serve, leading your forces in South Korea. I met him in 2008. And after that, we decided to participate in key resolve with some staff officers just to demonstrate you know, our interest in that area and to learn from a very different scenario than what we usually have been training for. Thank you. Um, Mr. Barthardi, I wanted to bring you back to the uh, issue of the way ahead in political and security relations with Russia. Um, I was in Moscow last month, and uh, I had to say that I got the sense from discussions with a number of uh, academicians and think tank experts that uh, their feeling is that the assessment in the Kremlin is that uh, the reset with NATO and with, and with the U.S. hasn't produced the dividends uh, that were expected and hoped for, and that um, assuming that President Putin is reelected in May, that, uh, that the Putin uh, administration in the future would take the view that, uh, that each of these steps towards cooperation would be, have to be judged very carefully uh, and or they would be met with countervailing actions and such, hence the rhetoric that we heard in December uh, uh, from both President Medvedev and Prime Minister Putin about uh, you know, retaliatory measures uh, in the absence of an, a return to some kind of treaty limits on missile defense, on treaty limits on NATO de or forward defense capabilities, that Russia would, uh, would have to take countervailing measures. I wonder if, do you see that as, as sort of the, uh, as a more difficult road ahead, you know, particularly as you look to the NATO summit in Chicago, uh, Heather alluded to the fact that obviously the missile defense cooperation has been disappointing. Uh, where do you, what do you think the scope and limits are of security cooperation with NATO, both uh, with security cooperation with NATO and with your own country and other European countries? <laughs> too hum. Yeah, well, I'm a, I'm a, well, uh, the, we see certain developments in Russia which are concerning. I think I can say that uh, on record as well. There are certain concerning domestic developments uh, that we have to monitor very closely, and it includes some of their, the way they are organizing on, and planning militarily. We see that also as a country who is a good neighbor of Russia and actually has a bilateral relationship which is better than ever. So we have this dual approach, and, we, and I keep saying 63 years of NATO membership has proved to us that it's very good to have that platform from which you can reach out a hand and have a dialogue with a big neighbor. It would be much more difficult without that platform. But I mean, they are actually uh, thinking and actually doing things which has to do with countermeasure our, uh, I mean, our, the MD approach. It's already happening, and we have to relate to that, and we have to recognize that it seems that we haven't completely convinced them that it's not about them. And in our meetings with Russia, and I had some recently in, in Moscow, and including the Security Council, I was asked 
my favorite question to ask in Moscow is why do you speak so much about us? Because we actually don't speak so much about you. Not because we don't care about you, but we don't, don't see you as the other. I mean, you're, you're a partner in many cases, and, and so what's the problem? Why don't, wouldn't you be more advised to concentrate on your south and east, where maybe more of your issues are? And I think, you know, I, I, I think they are, but I think the, on, on the surface level, they're very preoccupied with some old issues, which they're more comfortable with than the new issues. I don't want to say more about that I right here. Yeah. I understand. Why don't we bundle up a two questions? So we'll take the gentleman in the back and then the gentleman in the front, please. We'll take a couple at a time. Thank you. Uh, Ziad Asali, American Task Force on Palestine. I noticed on your answer about the Middle East that you have skipped over the Palestine-Israel conf conflict. And I wonder whether this means that this conflict is downgraded as a source of instability. And in a related question, can you envision a role for Europe uh, in this conflict that is coordinated but separate from what the United States uh, is doing at this point in time, especially perhaps on the uh, institution and state building uh, level? You said Palestine? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we are heavily involved in Palestine. We're, we're chairing the HALC, the Donors Committee. We're, we're in deeply involved in state building in the Palestine, in de facto in the West Bank because of the problems in Gaza, uh, while maintaining a very good relationship also with Israel. And, uh, and there is an international effort, in it, and it's, it's American, European, uh, Arab, uh, and it should remain like that. And I hope we can sort of save that from other issues that are penetrating. The reason I didn't, I didn't mention Israel, Palestine, nor Afghanistan, uh, not because they are less important, but because I, would, I wanted to sort of move into the future business at also the strategic level. This remains, and let me say that very clearly, it's not that you know, these questions will be solved and then we go to something else. It's rather than we will have sort of two lines. We'll have a one set of strategic issues which has to do with how we as organized states uh, relate to a number of other organized states. And then we have another issue which is uh, the kind of the managing chaos uh, theme and uh, uh, counter uh, terrorism and all that and th these things will be there simultaneously and that's the new thing because if you if I paint a broad picture you know in the Cold War we had sort of one set of issues which were the main concern and everything else was subordinate right there was the east-west conflict and all in you know, nuclear parity and all that and then we ended up we ended that fortunately and then we went into uh, 20 years where we were basically focusing on regional conflicts and issues where which were ser very serious but not really you know, on the level that the East-West conflict was. And I'm suggesting now we're going to deal with issues on both those scales in the future. And that's, that's my message now. It's not, it does not suggest that any of the remaining lingering conflicts are anywhere near to being solved. Uh, but but uh, there's another theme out there. Uh, thank you. Uh, Matthew Emery with uh, United Macedonian Diaspora. I want to go back uh, to your chat about uh, enlargement of NATO uh, and kind of look at that in a forward uh, tone as well. What do you feel about the open door policy with NATO? Do you can, uh, believe that that should still remain in place? And what do you feel are the prospects on future membership for the Republic of Macedonia and Montenegro? Thank you. Good question. And I'm happy to give you a very clear answer. I think it's really unfortunate. Uh, to, to use a very diplomatic word, that very alien issues prevented your membership when you were as prepared as several and some other countries when, when you were supposed to join the alliance. We strongly supported you and will continue to support, if not, I mean, you, Macedonia, uh, uh, on that issue. And, and please take note that I called it Macedonia. And, uh, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I feel a diplomatic yeah. intervention coming yeah. on. All right. <laughs> But, 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 to be, but to be very frank and honest, I mean, I, it, 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 well, I mean, I think we have to, we have to, um, we have to complete the enlargement to the Balkans, because NATO is all around you. You have NATO on all sides, you know, Albania, Greece, you know, Bulgaria, well, not Serbia yet, but you know, it's, you know, it, 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 but, but we're very close to having, you know, just a small hole inside the completely nationalized territory. It should be completed. There are certain steps, I mean, you still have to do something, the neighbors have to do something, but we have to complete that. But I think it's fair to say, to be very honest, that you know, it, NATO is not, you know, bustling with enthusiasm for further enlargement. It's not the impression you get if you go to NATO headquarters that you're looking for a new country to include. So, I mean, you have to keep up the fight.
Hi, Megan Warren with the Center for Nonproliferation Studies. So I think you probably know where my question is going. Um, what are your thoughts on the current uh, deterrence review that's happening under NATO right now? And what are your thoughts on the future of non-strategic weapons in Europe? I mean, I, I'm, first we have, this country has the most progressive policy on nukes for you know, many generations by actually de facto having introduced negative security guarantees, which has been one of the one of the uh, requirements of the peace movement for many years. And uh, I would very much like to see that we could at least copy the American language in NATO texts. Uh, and the problem is not here, but in other countries with <coughs> nuclear weapons uh, in Europe. Uh, and, uh, and we also, we, we did get into the strategic concept was the principal determination of NATO to contribute to the work of a non-nuclear world which NATO hasn't said in the same way before. I mean, of course, it also says that as long as there are nuclear weapons in the world, NATO will have some of them. So, I mean, that, but still, you know, the principal idea and also the need to connect to the NPT process and so on is important. So I think, you know, this is going to be a very important question uh, for Chicago and so on. I, I don't expect any significant decisions, but it's still there. But, but let me just point out one point which is often forgotten. In order to gradually reduce our dependence on nuclear weapons, we need to uphold a conventional deterrent capacity. And one of my concerns, and one of the things that can, can keep me awake at night, or not often, but could, is that you know, if, if, if we went down the track of special, that all our conventional forces were designed for you know, asymmetric theaters and not really for war fighting, and we had nukes, then we could have a situation which was a little too big for the conventional force we still had, but hopefully you know, too small for actually going nuclear. And we should avoid that. So to have a flexible, you know, a flexible conventional response is part of the work for, a, you know, the long-term work of reducing the salience of nuclear weapons. I don't think that's going to happen anything soon, but at least we should keep working in that direction. Yes, Ken Chastain from the Army staff. This is a follow-up on the, uh, the Balkans question. You talked about the NATO reluctance uh, for enlargement. You also talked about, you said that the uh, promise of the European attraction is gone with the uh, European Eurozone crisis. What about the rest of the Balkans? I mean, in recent years, Bosnia, Kosovo, Serbia, that area has been relatively quiet with a few exceptions. But now if that promise of enlargement is gone, what carrots do you offer to keep the situation quiet in Bosnia and in Kosovo and in Serbia? Exactly. <laughs> that's the problem, I and mean, that's, I mean, that's a very good uh, specification of my point, you know, that the power of attraction is gone and that's a problem. Because maybe that is, currently, it's more important than the force presence to keep some of these countries where they are, that they have this long-term vision. I think, you know, the biggest country in the Balkans, at least if the Balkans means the former Yugoslavia, is Serbia, and they've been doing surprisingly well. I'm actually positively surprised that Tadic still is there given all the forces around that could draw in a different direction. We must be very careful not to create a situation where we wake up with a completely different Serbian government and wonder what they did wrong when we had him. And that, uh, that's really serious. We've had working a lot with that. And we, the, the, the Partnership for Peace decision was highly influenced by our working in favor of it. And, and we have to comp continue down that path because the alternative is far worse. And, you know, I think Bosnia has... Um, there's one lesson, actually there's a lesson from Bosnia to Afghanistan, I think. And, and, I, and I think the lesson is that to have a solid presence for many years is, is unavoidable in certain cases. But you have to start, you know, preparing for allowing a mature political life to develop uh, without eternally being there to say, no, you can't do that. Because if, you, we, if he keeps saying you can't introduce that law forever, then they, you can go on and do ethnopolitics because it doesn't matter because there's a Western OHR or whatever it's called for every given moment. You can say, no, you, you can't do that. So, so I think to, to, you know, to be somewhat aware that our presence in this kind of conflict over time can be a part of the answer but also part of the problem. And it's interesting to see that some other countries on the Balkans have actually done wh whom we left earlier are doing better than those who left late. Mr. Minister, I have one final question, and this is to take off your defense minister hat um, and to offer some personal reflections, if, if you are willing. Uh, coming up on the six-month anniversary of the tragedy of July the 22nd in, in Norway, how has Norway changed? 
how has the political body changed and how will it forward? Uh, that was uh, something that, as all of us watch, I had at a time a wonderful Norwegian intern who was giving me his brother uh, was on the island, uh, came home to us, uh, just the emotional uh, outpouring. Could you give us your thoughts, your closing thoughts uh, on, on that six months later? Well, I mean, it was um, an enormous shock, you know, not, you know, it would be a big shock in any country, but I think it was particularly strong in the sense that we were so accustomed to the assumption that we were, or are still, one of the most peaceful, non-violent countries in the world. So it was sort of more uh, you know, it's, 75 people, keep, people, people killed is equally bad in any country. But there are countries that are more used to it than we are. So, of course, the effect on the society was tremendous. Um, but I think, you know, we do take pride in the fact that we had a collective response that practically everybody joined into by saying that the purpose of terrorists is to change us. So the first thing we can do is not allow ourselves to change, but to stay who we were, to maintain an open society and maintain, you know, tolerance uh, and so on. And, and that was the rallying cry both from, from the government, but I mean actually from everyone in the society and from all political parties, which is increasingly important. I mean, incredibly important that nobody actually tried to capture this and say, this is because we didn't do this, so we should have done that. We're obviously going to do certain things on the preparedness side on, on and, and police cooperation with the military. I mean, there, are, there are technical issues, but the fundamental features of our society will remain open and tolerant and, and inclusive. And, and I know personally, and also heard others say, that several Norwegians with a non-Norwegian ethnic background are actually saying that they feel more Norwegian after this event than before. Uh, because, of course, this terrorist attack was a white supremacist, racist uh, ideology, one person, um, who were attacking multiculturalism. So, I mean, that's an argument for multiculturalism, not against. Well, thank you very much. And uh, again, what a privilege and an honor uh, for you to be with us uh, and to provide such a wonderful and candid assessment of the future and the state of the transatlantic relationship. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you helped make this a great discussion because your questions were fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank Espen Barthida for joining us.